Sweet, we're good to go. You can start whenever you're ready, Roberto. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Bienvenidos, compañeros y compañeras que están en Cuba con nosotros esta noche en el Facebook. Thank you for joining us. My name is Roberto Royval. I'm with the New Mexico Venceremos Brigade. And uh, just briefly, the Venceremos Brigade was founded in 1969. In the previous year, a bunch of uh, 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 student uh, radicals from the United States had gone down to Cuba for the 10 ton uh, Cuban uh, sugar harvest. Fidel had uh, invited people to come and visit from the United States. So in 1969, uh, People from the U.S. went on the first contingent of events that was brigade from around the country. Uh, one of our compañeros here in New Mexico uh, uh, went on the second contingent. Uh, uh, then uh, my first contingent was um, in 1979. I'd gone to Cuba in 78 with the International Festival of Youth and Students. But the Vents Amos Brigade is a solidarity organization. We uh, show solidarity and support of the Cuban Revolution. And that's why we go to Cuba to see firsthand what's going on there. And we come back and more importantly for us to educate people in the United States about what's really going on in the United States and not to listen to all the BS that the government and everybody says about Cuba. Uh, I've really loved my trips there. I've been there a whole bunch of times. And um, in 2019, uh, the Vents Animals Brigade celebrated our 50th anniversary of the Vents Animals Brigade, 50 of us went. And then uh, this year we had a great contingent from New Mexico that are on our panel tonight and they'll be introducing themselves. And um, you're always welcome to join us. We do this, uh, this uh, round table every month on Facebook and Zoom. So please join us. And if you are interested in going to Cuba, and I would strongly urge you, it's, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. I've, I've learned so much by going to Cuba I've made some of my best friends. Uh, we get constant communications from our friends in Cuba. And so uh, if you have any questions about the brigade during our question and answer period, we can come back and talk a little bit about that as well. Okay, Oni, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Roberto. Thank you everybody for joining us on Zoom and also on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Thanks for the magic of technology. As Roberto mentioned, this is our monthly political education event organized by the New Mexico Bensademas Brigade. My name is Onyesanu. I am an organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And I also went to Cuba for the first time last summer with the VB. So we do these every single month. We focus on a different political education topic. And this month, the topic we want to talk about is the revolutionary necessity of solidarity between African and indigenous and Chicano people struggles in Turtle Island, and also how we can learn from the example of Cuban internationalism to learn about how to be in better solidarity um, with each other's struggles. So we have a really, really great panel of speakers today, all organizers who are active in the movement for national liberation for their people and who are also experts on international solidarity as well as um, with deep knowledge of Cuba solidarity and other international solidarity movements. And so I wanna introduce each of our speakers before we jump into the questions. First up is Ajamu Umi of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Ajamu is a longtime cadre with the AAPRP. He is a revolutionary organizer and activist and also an advisor and liberation literature author, the author of many great books, also an expert on the Cuban revolution. Next up, we have Reyes DeVore of Pueblo Action Alliance. Reyes of Jemez Pueblo continues to actively organize events within the community to continue the conversation about environmental justice and the social impacts of indigenous peoples. Before taking on her role with PAA, she was invested in early childhood education as a teacher and home visitor. She has over seven years of experience working with marginalized communities where she provided parent education on child development to break cycles of trauma and build healthy relationships in the home. Reyes also currently works with the Native American Community Academy here in Tiwa territory, also known as Albuquerque, where she helps implement their indigenized curriculum with high school students, she has co-developed the Cultivating Indigenous Resistance Workshop and leads the youth internship with Pueblo Action Alliance. In addition to the many roles she plays within indigenous communities, she is a mother to a 12-year-old son who ultimately drives her compassion to continue this life work. And she is also lead in coordinating mutual aid efforts for Pueblo Action Alliance alongside indigenous organizations, seeding sovereignty. And last but not least, we have Lois Head of, or Lewis Head 
of Southwest Organizing Project. Lewis Head was a Southwest Organizing Project staff member from 1982 to 1998, after which he co-founded and directed a New Mexico-based NGO, the Cuba Research and Analysis Group, which engaged in applied research on US-Cuba relations and other matters, and conducted a variety of exchange projects and programs between the two countries, especially between Cuba and what is known as the US Southwest. In 2004, working with arts presenters and cultural workers from throughout the US, head coordinated US-Cuba Cultural Exchange, which contested US policy, which shut down cultural pathways between the two countries and directly led to Barack Obama's rescinding of anti-Cuba regulations regarding culture during the first months of that administration. Lois has served as co-chair of the National Network on Cuba from 2008 to 2010 and coordinated Cuba-related activities at the U.S. Social Forum in 2007 and again in 2010. He began traveling to Cuba with the Vencedamos Brigade over 40 years ago and has been to Cuba many times over the years. So welcome Ajamu, Reyes, and Lewis. Thank you so much for joining us. We are really excited to have you and to have this conversation with y'all. So let's jump right into it. As I mentioned, this panel is gonna be about the necessity of solidarity between colonized people's struggles here on Turtle Island. And each of these speakers has a very valuable perspective to share on that question. And so the first question I have for y'all, which anybody can answer, is what responsibility do colonized people's struggles in the US have to the global struggles of other oppressed peoples around the world? Be shy. Ajamu, go. <laughs> so, so I, I believe that, um, greetings everyone. I believe that um, it is our absolute responsibility to be conscious of, aware and participating in our struggles for justice, not in isolation just with our communities, but with the world community that's fighting for justice because you know, we're, we're Africans, we're Pan-Africanists. So our, the basis of our work is understanding that the entire wealth of the capitalist system derives primarily from exploiting Africa, Africa's human and material resources. So we can't, we can't look at the problem as just being a problem in the US because the problem didn't start in the US. The fact that I'm sitting here right now is because of an international terrorist act of kidnapping and slavery. So from the very beginning, it was the international struggle. So we believe that people, oppressed communities have to have that international perspective that we're involved in a world struggle against international crooks, robbers, capitalists, and imperialists. Well, thank you so much, Adama, for lifting that. It's absolutely true that the struggle against the systems oppressing all of us has always been an international struggle. And especially for those of us speaking from Turtle Island from the belly of the beast, we have to understand that this empire is constantly attacking other oppressed nations, indigenous and African peoples all around the world, including in Cuba. So Reyes or, or Lewis, do you have any thoughts on this question as well? Uh, I'll, I'll jump out there and a uh, couple of things. First of all, uh, thanks. It's, it's great to be here with everybody. Um, and I also wanna send a shout out to AAPRP that I worked really closely with AAPRP comrades uh, for many years in the National Network on Cuba and uh, good friends. Um, and really glad that you've been able to step up here in New Mexico and kind of move the Vencedemos Brigade, right? Because as you know, uh, little Vencedemos Brigade has a very strong history here. Um, and another thing I want to say is that, you know, I don't claim to speak on behalf of any Chicanos or, you know, Mexicanos here in the Southwest or any African or African descendant people here or indigenous people. Uh, I've rather worked in settings where it was all about uh, creating the basis and, and resourcing uh, the possibility for people to speak on behalf of themselves, right? Uh, which is really uh, a key part of what the Southwest Organizing Project was about coming up. Um, I think, and wow, there's a lot to unpack in this point, but you know, as Ajamu was saying, or, or leading to, I think I want to follow up on that and just say that the United States is the crucible of racialized capitalism uh, in the sense that, or, or, or as being the, the most advanced outcome, if you will, if you allow me to use that word in a very narrow technical way uh, of all of these threats. And uh, if you're looking at 
the formation of white supremacy, if you're looking at the formation of uh, really advanced patriarchy in, in the context of capital at the international level. And uh, how things got constructed here leads to the question for all of us of how we are going to deconstruct things over time and how we are deconstructing that over time, not only to, just to think about it, in the, in, but rather to uh, really take action. And um, I think that a lot of us looking around at what's been going on, especially the past um, quite a few years in my perspective with neoliberalism, but also looking at the past you know, 10, 15 years, uh, 20 years, really going back to 9-11, uh, we're seeing these contradictions just come to a head so much right now. And we've seen it in electoral politics. We've seen it in so many things with the, this government we've been dealing with, regardless of who's in charge. Uh, I say that. But um, yeah, it's, it, it, these things have to be totally linked. And I think one thing I'll say about Cuba, and I know we're going to talk more about Cuba solidarity, is that it's important to re realize that uh, Cuba is in a very unique position, maybe not a totally unique position, but uh, in terms of the history of the development of capitalism uh, internationally, Cuba was a linchpin in that. Um, and, you know, the Cuban revolution, sometimes it gets accused, or the things they always throw at revolutions is, uh, got it, why, well, they're not self-sufficient, so how can, as if that's a kind of thing of authenticity, right? And I like to say that about Cuba, because Cuba was developed completely as a dependent uh, entity within global capitalism as it took shape, and that's very much influenced how Cuba, I think, is related to a whole lot of people around the world, including here in the United States. Anyway, I'll pass it to maybe to Reyes. Uh, thank you, Luis. Um, they know I ni washle pahin, um, ni to attach a thimble no pasho pahin. Um, hello, everyone, again. Um, my name is Reyes Devor. I wanted to introduce myself in my traditional language, Toa. I'm from the Pueblo of Himes. And um, yeah, this definitely is kind of a big question. Um, as you know, Oni kind of said in like my bio a little bit earlier, you know, it's taken time, you know, to kind of um, unlearn a lot of things that have been taught to us, you know, and relearn um, what is important, you know, and how I can, you know, continue to fight for my people. So over the years, I have learned that, you know, standing up against injustices isn't activism, it's life work. Pueblo people have been defending their territory since time of memorial. And as a descendant of revolutionary people, I, along with PAA, FAM, you know, we recognize that this is life work, you know, like it is our duty. It is our birthright to defend our people, our land and our life ways. So as a Pueblo person, you know, I, I often reflect back on the Pueblo revolt. You know, I picture what those times look like and what it felt like. and. I even often have these conversations with my son, who's like a, you know, a huge reason as to why I continue to do, um, again, this life work. You know, I personally acknowledge that my role as a matriarch is really big, and I don't, I don't take that lightly. You know, I am an auntie to lots of nieces and nephews. You know, and I belong to uh, my community at home, and they're the people that, um, you know. Um, I will continue to fight for. So, you know, that is my responsibility that I take on as a matriarch and as a public person, but also as a descendant of rev revolutionary people. Um, so when we take a seat back and look at the larger picture in terms of global struggle, um, first off, it must be acknowledged that classism and capitalism is global. You know, oppression is not unique to this land base. So, um, you know, the, mili the US military has bases in countries all over the world and they continue to oppress the working class peoples. And I also think it, um, when, when we begin to unlearn, you know, and unveil what imperialism means and how the military continues to oppress people, I also think it is our job to also share that information with community members, but then also be in solidarity with those working class peoples because we live in this land base that is the so-called US empire. Therefore, I strongly hurt and feel for those people who 
are feeling the oppression from the US military, like worldwide. So I think that has a lot to do with um, why we should continue to be in solidarity with like global struggles and other oppressed peoples. Thank you so much, Reyes. And that actually leads um, to a question that I want to ask you specifically about your experience building international solidarity with other indigenous people's struggles beyond the United States. Um, so what has been your experience with that work in the Western Hemisphere and beyond, and why is this work important? Yeah, so um, my experience with building international solidarity and other Indigenous peoples comes from a trip that I made when I traveled to MST, which is the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil. This was in 2017, and the opportunity actually came from a relationship that was built with SWAP. So um, shout out to SWAP, you know, they've also sent other peoples in the past to go help and build and learn with the MST. And so um, for those of you who are not familiar with the MST, it is a mass social movement in Brazil formed by the working class people and all those who want to fight for land reform and against um, injustices and social inequalities in a lot of the rural areas, which I call um, with the, which they call the favelas out there. So when I went there, this course was not specifically just tied to like indigenous people. Um, this course included 79 participants from 26 different countries and 51 organizations who are also in the struggle against those oppressive systems within their communities. And that was like a really big eye opener in terms of like why we should be in solidarity and why it's our responsibility to um, be in the like global solidarity with the global struggle, because I heard one day, I'll never forget sitting in that classroom, all the ways that the US military hurts their people. And that happened to be on so-called Independence Day. <laughs> and I was in Brazil and it was just so like that day still very sits um, very strongly with me. And I think that like, that was definitely a catalyst to kind of like keep trying to push and learn as best as I can. And, you know, going to Brazil was one of my first times ever taking an international trip, you know, so I never studied abroad before. And I had to, you know, kind of sit with this opportunity that had been given to me. Um, and then, you know, I came to realize how important it was for me to share this history because I would be able to share knowledge and truths as a public matriarch and an indigenous person from the so-called US. And I was there for eight weeks. And, um, you know, within the MST, they also work in solidarity with indigenous peoples of Brazil. And so when about the maybe the fifth or sixth week that I was there, they assigned us to go visit all the other different camps, the campesinos, all the other villages that the MST has built, you know, and I don't think it was any coincidence that the MST decided that I go visit the Guarani Kiowa peoples in Mato Grosso do Sul. It was a 16 hour bus ride. All of us all cramped in there. And, um, you know, it was a very bittersweet experience. Very, very bittersweet because while it was amazing to meet other indigenous peoples, it was very hard also because it reminded me of the daunting history of violence, of colonialism that, you know, indigenous people have never collectively consented to. And um, while I was there, you know, I tried to, you know, just share, you know, I, I, I hear you, I feel you. Unfortunately, I understand you. And um, I had some comrades there that, you know, helped me translate <laughs> anytime I could, so I could have these conversations with them. And, um, you know, there, there are people who don't want anything to do with consumerism, capitalism. They want to just live with the land and they're continuously occupying and living. Um, what people would call it squatting here um, is technically what they're doing in, in Brazil, but they're not squatting. They're taking rightful ownership of their land. So they'll just go right back wherever like agro-business capitalism sits on ancestral lands of um, Brazil peoples, they'll go and they'll just, they'll like, this is ours, 
we're going to make a village here and you guys can leave. You know, that's what I admire about their resistance because they're just like, I don't know what you guys are thinking, but you're on our land and we're just going to live here and make a community and you guys can continue to um, to try and make us move. While, while it's very strong, you know, there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of murders, there's a lot of things that happen, unfortunately, for them to resist in this way. So, you know, it took me a really long time to even write about this experience because there was so much to capture and how do you encapsulate eight weeks and then this journey, you know, being with them. And so I, I finally got the opportunity to um, sit with myself and write these things. And this actually came because of, again, unfortunately, because of COVID, you know, um, PAA has been doing a lot of mutual aid work. And when, when, we, when I got word that the Guadani Kiowa villages that I visited with were deeply impacted, you know, that shook me to my core again, you know, and PAA, we, you know, we came together like, all right, how do we help our peoples? How do we extend mutual aid beyond this U.S. land base in Tiwa territory? And we were able to have uh, Zoom calls. We were able to have meetings with them to listen to them and figure out what they need. Because unfortunately, the Brazilian government, which was led by the racist, violent Bolsonaro, has vetoed many different bills that would have helped them. Therefore, they have had to also defend their communities. You know, that community defense model is also there as well. And, you know, that just showcases for me and I like I, for PAA as well, you know, like it's extremely important that we stand in solidarity with other indigenous peoples, you know, because again, it is an extension of white supremacy and capitalist commodification, resource extraction, you know, I could go down the list of all the different things that the ways that we are impacted, but, um, you know, that solidarity is going to continue to be built there because it needs to be there, it has to be there, and it also kind of uplifts you to be in relationship and build deep relationships with other people, especially Indigenous people, halfway across the world who are in that same fight and it is it is our duty to to be there with them with that so sorry that was such a long um answer but i kind of had to like you know preface that a little bit to kind of share about the mst as well you're on mute oni <laughs> Yeah, it was not letting me unmute, trying to silence me soon. Thank you, Reyes. I appreciate you so much. And I appreciate that answer and providing that context about what international solidarity can look like between indigenous struggles. And as you mentioned, um, Brazil right now is under a fascist dictatorship that has a very, very close relationship with the US empire. Like throughout the Western hemisphere, throughout Central and South America, the influence of the US empire has been right wing, has been white supremacist, has been patriarchal, has been extractive. And so we have this model of extremely reactionary solidarity between capitalist and fascist forces. But we also very luckily have the model of international, internationalism embodied by the work of PAA with the MST, but also embodied by the work of Cuba and how Cuba has shown up in solidarity li with liberation struggles in this hemisphere and throughout the world really. And so question I have for y'all is how is the way that Cuba has shown up in solidarity with other liberation struggles informed your own solidarity work? So I I'll just say that as an African, uh, we just feel like we owe Cuba everything for so many things that we cannot even name, but one quick example I can give you is uh, the effort of Ernesto Che Guevara in 1964 to go over to the Congo, which he did, and to take 100 Cubans with him to do their best to battle against the reactionary neo-colonial forces that were backed by the US CIA, we call them criminals in action, um, to steal away the vast resources that the Congo offers. And, of course, um, Che and the Congolese national movement, they were not successful in that endeavor, but what it did do is it established Cuba's relationship with African liberation movements. And those efforts expanded exponentially over the years. 
to the point where um, in the late 1980s and early 90s, um, when apartheid forces in a Zany era, what, what people call South Africa, were moving to uh, include Namibia, Mozambique, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, to engulf all of Southern Africa under their racist apartheid practices, nobody in the world responded to that except Cuba. And they sent 500,000 troops there and they fought diligently and to the point where they forced these reactionary racists to back off. And most people don't know this, but the independence of Namibia would not have happened um, were it not negotiated that Namibia would be able to become independent with the withdrawal of those Cuban troops from Southern Africa. The release of Nelson Mandela from prison would never have happened were it not for this effort. So as an African, a conscious African, we will always respect the Cuban revolution because they did that, they, they received nothing in return. We had nothing to give them, but they sacrificed so much to fight for Africa and African people. And we just love the Cuban revolution for that. And nobody, nobody come to us and try to say anything negative about the Cuban revolution or Che Guevara. Don't be in swing distance if you come to us talking like that. Thank you, Ajamu. Louis or Reyes, do you have any thoughts on this question? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll jump in. Or, or uh, uh, another gentleman, and Ajamu knows, knows who I'm talking about, uh, is Victor Drecke. No, yes really got developed in that whole experience, right? It became really, in a lot of respects, Cuba's point person of African descent, right? On the, on the scene internationally, he was so involved in so many things. Um, uh, I just, one thing I wanna say really quickly here is uh, just how Cuba showed up for um, us here in New Mexico, okay? Mm. In, 40 years ago, I mean, a lot of people don't know this about SWAP, but if, uh, SWAP, the Vincent Amos Brigade had everything to do with the Southwest Organizing Project coming together. Uh, we had people in national leadership of the, uh, the Vincent Amos Brigade going back quite a few years into the 70s. And in 1979, and this was before I was in New Mexico, uh, but uh, a number of uh, Mexicanos from the Southwest, Chicanos uh, came together during brigade uh, in the evenings in the camp uh, where the brigade goes uh, outside southwest of Havana. Uh, and just to talk about what the state, state of the Chicano movement was, right? And there were Cubans that sat in on that. I mean, I'm not talking about any material aid. I'm not talking about any training. I'm not just to say that. It was very much moral support. But I know that when SWAP came together in the early 80s, um, it was tough pulling together new things at that time. Ronald Reagan had been elected. You had this onslaught of neoliberalism that we kind of started to get a better handle on later. Uh, it was uh, very difficult to talk openly even about your politics in a lot of ways. Um, and we had to claw our way out of this space where so many social movements had um, just you know diminished uh, so significantly during the 70s. You know? And you know, there were people that encouraged us and the Cubans were definitely some of those people. And, and the point I, the point I want to make related to this is that at that same time, um, there was a lot of activity there. There was emerging activity in the United States, mostly people that had been involved, uh, uh, people of European descent that had been involved in anti-war activities who were doing work related to Central America. They called it solidarity work and all that kind of thing. And uh, it, the way the Cubans related to us was very, very different than what I saw going on between here and those countries because the Cubans would say, you know, come down and visit us, you know, learn from us. Let's be, you know, let's get to know each other. We wanna know about you and we want you to go back home and do what you gotta do because you got a job to do inside the United States. And uh, that maybe doesn't get said, said that way these days as much. You, know, you won't hear it quite that way. Uh, but it certainly was the message that 
uh, we heard back in those days. And it was, uh, of course, very inspirational to us. And we engaged quite a bit um, with Cuba uh, over the years um, in, the, in the Southwest Organizing Project, obviously still do. So. And I'd like to add, on this question as well. I'd like, sorry. May I add something now? Um, of just to add to what Lewis said, uh, I was in Cuba in 1979. That was the 10th anniversary of the Cuban Revolution. And at that point, people here in, in, in Albuquerque, in New Mexico, had been talking about building an organization because if we remember after the Reagan years and everything, a lot of community organizing fell down. Here in New Mexico, we saw a real vacuum. So we knew we had to build a community-based organization uh, fighting for social justice. So when we went to Cuba in 79, we called comrades of ours that had gone to Cuba from around the Southwestern United States. because we, we had these grand ideas of Southwest. So we invited our friends from, uh, from Tejas, from Southwest Workers Union, from friends in the Bay Area, from Los Angeles, different areas in the Southwest. And we talked about building this group like the Southwest Organizing Project. And the, the Cubans were in those meetings with us. And uh, so, and they were very influential as well. So we built a very long lasting friendship and relationship with the Cuban people. I remember for our 10th anniversary, we invited the Cubans, the Cubans came to our 10th anniversary of the Southwest Organizing Project. And uh, we hosted them. And we've had a number of Cubanos and Cubanas come and visit us here. And uh, we do our best to show them the hospitality that they've given us. We take them around to, to see the different uh, territories, Tiwa, Tiwa, Toa around the state, Terrasan folks. And it's always been real important for us to, to share those experiences with the, with the Cubanos when we host them here. And, um, you know, like Lewis is saying, you know, the, the swap and I work at swap. I've been at swap uh, since we were founded in 1980. And um, the Vance Amos Brigade had a lot to do with it. a lot of our, the folks that formed the Southwest Organizing Project had been to Cuba over the years with the Vance Amos Brigade. Thanks so much, Roberto. And thank you, Lewis and Ajamo for your answers. What y'all really elevated is that we obviously have the example of Cuban revolutionary solidarity, of Cuban internationalism, that it looked like military solidarity with anti-colonial struggles in Africa. It looks like medical solidarity, especially during the COVID pandemic. Like imagine if Cuba did not exist during COVID-19, woo, a lot of countries would be a much rougher place. But we also have the revolutionary example of the Cuban revolution itself of a revolution in which an oppressed people organized and united to overthrow their condition and to build a socialist state. And so for those of us on Turtle Island and throughout the world that are struggling against our own forms of oppression, Cuba is a powerful example of what's possible that we have the opportunity to learn from because they still exist and they're still free. Um, but here within you know, capitalist society, um, colonized peoples, oppressed peoples get a lot of messaging that divides and conquers us. Like African people are taught that we're on our own and no one's on our side. Indigenous people are taught not to be in solid or, 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 or some messaging is taught telling them not to be in solidarity with other struggles. We're basically like constantly receiving all these messaging um, that's saying like every man for himself. And so a question I've had for the panelists is why is it important for African, indigenous and Chicano people struggles on Turtle Island to move in solidarity with each other and what should the solidarity look like? I see Lewis came off mute. Go for it, comment. I did. <laughs> you took me off mute. I'll, uh, I'll just say that it's essential because we're not going to transform this place if that doesn't happen. It's as simple as that. And it's not simply about transforming the United States because nothing just happens in the United States because of the relationships, right? And, and, and also the historical relationships and what ended up happening here um, that I was speaking to earlier. Uh, it's all, um, all totally, re totally related. So that's, a simple, that's the, my simple answer to that. <laughs> well, um, 
I would first, you know, like to just extend like great gratitude to SWAP and AAPRP, you know, who have shown us support and uplifted the revolutionary work that PA is working towards um, for liberation, you know. And um, I say that because that I believe it's a model of how each of our struggles are understood. They're heard, but they're also respected, you know, um, especially when it comes to indigenous peoples, you know, um, you know, as the first stewards and the, you know, the first peoples of this land, we should be able to um, practice and like practice, um, you know, older life ways, but also bridging and looking like how um, building um, newer ways of uh, systems of living, right? And what will work for one indigenous community is not gonna work for another. And so when I say that, it's also gonna vary across each group of people who are in the struggle. Therefore, we cannot and should not be pushing other systems of living onto people, especially if they're like Western ideologies, um, because everyone's community needs are gonna be different, you know? And we've are indigenous people have always been collectively and communally living, you know, and we cannot be pressing and we cannot be um, pressuring or shaming other like indigenous peoples for not working towards socialism or communism, you know, not to say that these things have not worked in other places, you know, for indigenous peoples, it's gonna look different. And then it's gonna look different as you break it down for even each public community, you know? And I think that's something that needs to be, um, be reminded when we're working towards liberation, you know, like we respect, you know, APRP um, for the work that they do, you know, and their liberation and their, their struggles and how um, you guys are working to liberate your people. And we know that, you know, and we respect it. And it's like a reciprocal relationship. And it comes down to like really stepping in for each other, you know, showing up in all the ways that are beyond just like um, community events, you know, showing up in the times of where we are needed in the front lines as well. Thank you so much, Reyes. And what you said about how, first of all, the relationship between the APRP and Pueblo Action Alliance and Southwest Organizing Project was born in Cuba. Um, mm -hmm. The folks on this call, Roberto and Sheldon and myself and Julia, um, our comrade in PAA, like that's where we got close. Like that's where we built our relationship. When we came back, we started working together on Cuba Solidarity Work. So just like SWAP was deeply inspired by the Cuban Revolution and was born in Cuba, so was the relationship between our organizations. And another thing you said about, you know, how we can't, when we're in solidarity with each other's struggles, we cannot have, um, we can't dictate what other people's struggles look like. We have to show up. Um, as we're asked to not be telling them what to do. I feel like it's really important that solidarity with work with Cuba follows that same principle. A lot of times, particularly here in the belly of the beast, there is a really paternalistic approach towards being in solidarity with other nations. And that sometimes shows up, unfortunately, in Cuba solidarity work. And so I think what Ray has just said is something really important to keep in mind when we're thinking about how to be not just in solidarity with African and indigenous and Chicano struggles, but also how to be in solidarity with the Cuban revolution. And then Ajamu, did you have thoughts on this question or anything that's been said? Yeah, I just wanted to add, thank you, um, that, you know, in the All African People's Revolutionary Party, like when I joined this organization in 1984, it was a non-starter for anybody to be talking about, yeah, this is our land as African people. Like it, that was a non-starter. That was a non-compromising position. This is indigenous people's land. And we saw, we saw and continue to see our responsibility here as educating our people, educating the African masses about that question. And so, you know, you all know, like imperialism uses different, the, it, it oppresses all of us, but it uses specific techniques based on the history of the people it's oppressing. So for the African masses, their technique is they have to separate us from Africa. They have to keep us ignorant about Africa. They have to make us believe that we have no connection to Africa. And the only thing that we have is to exist within the capitalist system here. There's anybody that suggests anything else is insane. That's, that's the, the strategy that, that they utilize against us. And as a result of that, it's created 
so many dysfunctions, so many ideological and psychological dysfunctions among our people. And people, because they don't know anything about Africa, they know people are starving over there, they're fighting, they can't get along, they haven't accomplished anything. People begin to make up things. While we're the people that are indigenous to the Western hemisphere, African people are indigenous. You know, this is, in our community, this is a thing right now. This is a thing that we're battling against. We are the ones that are indigenous here. So. You know, my daughter and I, for the party, we do seminars every Sunday. And this coming Sunday, the topic is true and just solidarity with indigenous people. And I cannot even tell you all how many people, African people are reaching out to us and we're struggling with them because they're like, well, this is our land. And it's like, no, it's not. It's not your land, never has been. You just don't know anything about Africa. So you have drank the Kool-Aid about it. So we will continue to intensify that work and somebody today even told me, well, they don't even agree on who, whether they're, whether it's Chicano land or native land or whether they're Indians. I'm like, well, we, we have that struggle too. You know, you, you're calling yourself an African-American, which is confusion. You know, that's like Jewish people calling themselves Jewish Hitlers, as KRS-One used to say years ago. So this is a struggle that we as communities have a right to engage in. But from our standpoint, we support indigenous people and by when we say that we mean everybody indigenous to this hemisphere and we respect indigenous people's ability to decide what that looks like for themselves but from our standpoint we're africans we're fighting for african liberation and we want to do everything we possibly can to help indigenous people get this land back that was actually a really beautiful segue ajamu into a question that i have for you um, one of the common refrains within sub sub some segments of the African liberation struggle that has certainly been influenced by capitalism and imperialism is the idea that we as Africans have no friends, no friends in the whole right. world. Right. And so how do you think the history of Cuba solidarity with Africa challenges this, challenges this idea? And I've been talking to those people all week since we announced this topic. And, you know, the thing, the common denominator here is, again, we're cut off from our history and so I have never met an African who is knowledgeable about African history, who has been to Africa, who has participated in the Pan-African Liberation Movement, who articulates that nonsense. The only people who articulate, we don't have any friends, are people who don't study anything about history, don't aren't involved in the struggle at all, like in terms of participating. So their perspective is coming from some nebulous, petty bourgeoisie, information that they observe subjectively on social media, I guess. But I think to address that, our role has to be, again, this mass political education that we can provide endless examples of indigenous solidarity and support for African liberation. And we can talk about the Seminoles and we can talk about a number of indigenous people, I know that our people had one place to go when we ran from the slave plantation and that was where the indigenous people, there, there was nowhere else we could go. And so we have to educate our people about that. We have to educate them about our Asian comrades who have constantly supported from the civil rights to the black power to the Pan-African movement have supported that and everyone else. And we have to be you know, the, the Palestinians who were uh, messaging Black Lives Matter activists about what to do to, uh, uh, to disengage the tear gas that police were throwing at them. You know, we have so many examples of this. So our responsibility is to help people understand that history because the enemy is the one promoting this. Well, you don't have any friends. You're, you're isolated. All you have to do is just find some way to make it in the capitalist system and everything will be okay. So we're gonna, we're gonna continue that fight until we win. Can you speak a little bit more about how Cuba has showed up for Africa and African people? I mean, there are so many things we could talk about. You know, I gave the one example earlier. I'll give another example. Every African freedom fighter from this country, not only can we talk about the, the role Cuba has played, as you mentioned, me medical support in Africa from the Ebola outbreak to, to COVID-19 in 50 countries right now, Cuba is operational on the ground providing support and logistics. But 
there is not a sink education sending Africans to medical school so that they can go back to throughout the African world, whether it's the ghettos in this country, whether it's Canada, Europe, or Africa, and you know, engage those skills. But finally, the African freedom fighters who have been forced to leave wherever they were engaging in their fight, we can just talk about the US, have always found refuge in Cuba from Robert Williams to Eldridge Cleaver to Huey P. Newton. Kwame Ture participated in the 1967 uh, International Solidarity Conference in Cuba. And it was at that conference when where Comrade Fidel said, imperialism never better not touch a hair on your head. All the way up to Asada Shakur. When I went to Cuba, I was able to meet four or five former Black Panther Party members who have been living in Cuba for decades because it was the only place they could go where they could be safe. So, you know, we can. There's no question about the role that the socialist Cuban revolution has played in supporting African liberation, African people, and all of oppressed humanity. So for us, that means we have to return that and provide all of the support we can to the Cuban revolution. Thank you so much, Ajamu. Yeah, whenever someone says that to me, African people have no friends, I'm like, nope, Cuba is unequivocally a friend of Africa and African people and the African liberation struggle. The history is clear. Um, so another question I have specifically for Lewis or for Roberto is what inspiration does the movement for Chicano national liberation take from the Cuban revolution? Um. Briefly say plenty. Uh, it, you had it, at the time that the movement uh, had really reached maturity in this country. You saw a lot of people um, traveling. I've been sending most brigades to Cuba. Um, you saw um, just a lot of uh, inspiration drawn by what Cubans were doing, both in Cuba and in other parts of the world. Uh, that was just, it was just there at that point. Uh, one thing I'd like to say about this is that the whole issue of Cuba, and a lot of times, you know, directly related, the symbolism of Che Guevara, no? because um, Che was assassinated in, in 1967, and then uh, in the aftermath of that, uh, probably became even more flu influential amongst uh, progressive and revolutionary uh, people inside the United States. Um, but it also forced an issue. You know, and that was the whole question of uh, whether people were talking about a narrow kind of nationalism, uh, a petty bourgeois kind of nationalism, and internationalism. And part of the reason I raised that is just in my own practical experience in SWAP. I mean, that was a really, really important thing for SWAP um, because whereas SWAP was initially rooted, I think, in uh, the New Mexican Chicano community, um, it was a given that the organization was gonna be multiracial, uh, that it was gonna work with a lot of different kinds of sectors. And that ended up playing out over time um, but that was part of the conversation that folks were having is what's going to be the nature of the organization. And as SWAP exemplified uh, this move into new and I think really expanded terrain um, in terms of internationalism and how international struggles were related to what was going on here. Um, also others, uh, we're going through those same kinds of conversations, right? And so you've seen, uh, I mean, there were, there were some organizations that, that they, they wouldn't touch Cuba or it wasn't until a lot later on that they might have. Um, although it's been interesting just to see over the years how different sectors have related to Cuba. And it's always been dependent, I think, on the degree to which the United States was going to allow uh, for people to travel to and interact with Cubans. Uh, the, the, the more possible it becomes legally uh, getting licenses or what have you to go down there and getting authorizations. Um, you'll see uh, different kinds of sectors uh, 
step into uh, those spaces. And it's not like the Cubans are going to turn them away because the Cubans figure out how to work with all kinds of people, you know, and they're very, very good at that. Uh, they don't, they don't put ideology uh, as a barrier, no, in terms of how they go about dealing with it. They rather define solidarity or, you know, they, they define everything in terms of mutual mutuality, mutual assistance. And it goes back to, you know, Samora Machel's famous um, statement that solidarity is not, not an act of charity. It's a, uh, it's rather an act of mutual assistance amongst forces fighting the same enemy or something like quite like that. Um, so I think it's, I think it's been really a tremendous uh, impact. Um, although it's been interesting to see, you know, in the cold war, I think had something to do with it too, just how people dealt with Cuba. I mean, if you go back to the solidarity uh, work that people were talking about uh, earlier, um, and I and others spoke to, um, people went out of their way sometimes to kind of keep Cuba off the map. You're like, no, Cuba didn't have anything to do with what was going on in, in El Salvador, or Cuba didn't have anything to do with what was going on. Uh, okay, with what was going on in, uh, in in other parts of the world. You know, like it was wasn't cool to talk about that. You know, uh, when. Uh, in fact, um, you know, Cuban assistance, uh, if only as serving as a rear guard, as has been pointed out, it has served for people in this country. Um, that just by itself uh, was was a major contribution that Cuba made, you know, whether it be going there for education, going there for uh, medical care, whatever it may be. Um, it's, it's, it's a very uh, involved history. And there's been a lot that's been written on that that, that people can look at. And as we were saying also uh, with the Southwest Organizing Project, a good number of our founders came out of the Chicano Communication Center here in Albuquerque in the 70s. The Chicano Communication Center did the book 450 Years of Chicano History in 1976. And of course, a swap updated that book in 1991 and we call it 500 years of Chicano history. So I can remember going to Cuba a number of times and we would, we would visit people on the streets. They'd invite us into their homes for coffee. And I remember seeing a copy of 450 years of Chicano history in one of the comrades houses that they loved. And I happened to have taken some 500 years of Chicano history books with me and I gave it to them and they just loved me forever. And uh, so we built those personal relationships as well, but then just another aside, for instance, uh, people are familiar with the uh, Brown Berets. It was a Chicano nationalist uh, revolutionary group in, in, this, in, in the United States here on Turtle Island uh, that was very involved in Chicano communities. But a number of the people from the Chicano, uh, from that organization, from the, the, from the Brown Berets were going to Cuba. And in Cuba, it was all about international solidarity, internationalism, not nationalism. So uh, some of the folks from the Brown Berets that had gone to Cuba came back, back here and formed the Black Berets. The Black Berets were, are, were an internationalist organization. They believed in international solidarity and with the understanding that we have to work with everybody. I mean, this, uh, this capitalist imperialist beast is, is, a, is, is a, you know, we all have to work together to fight that. The only way we're gonna beat it is working together. Not any one group is going to do it on our own. We have to, all our communities have to work together. And that's what SWAP has been saying forever and working with people. We got a lot of that inspiration from the Cuban uh, people, the Cuban revolution. Thank you so much, Roberto, Ajamo, and Luis, and Reyes. This has been a really incredible panel. At this time, we want to open up the space for any questions um, from folks that are joining us either in Zoom or on social media. We have a couple of questions that came in. We also have 50 people watching <laughs> across various platforms. So woo! Um, so we do have a question from the audience. First question that I actually want to direct to Reyes is, what can people of African and indigenous descent do to further solidarity for our liberation struggles? Can you, can you repeat that question, please? 
of course. Question is, ooh, I lost it. One second. Sorry. Oh, yeah. What can people of African and indigenous descent do to further solidarity with our liberation struggle? You know, that, um, thank you for that question. You know, that's definitely um, a big question to answer, right? Because it's going to be dependent on um, what region you're coming from and where your Indigenous land base is at, right? And um, for me, automatically, I think of, you know, identity, right? I think of identity and um I hope that, you know, whomever asks this question, you know, I hope that you continue to stand strong in who you are as a person who is African descent and indigenous, you know, because I know that um, it is it is a hard, um, it can be hard to, to honor both sides, right? Therefore, you know, I, you know, I just encourage um, you or anybody who comes from both of those backgrounds to really just, learn more about where your ancestral lineage is from, learn about how your peoples um, need to be uplifted, look about, look at how maybe you can um, continue to support um, community needs. And I know that it is easier said than done, especially if you have not, you know, always lived within that community. I know for indigenous peoples, um, especially in public communities, sometimes, you know, we're, we're very small, right? So if, you, if you're not from that community, you're not like seen a whole lot, um, it can be challenging because you're, you're not looked at as a community member. And that's why I say, I hope that you strongly are continuously working on, um, you know, holding um, and believing in your identity and, and who you are and standing firmly with that and um, continue to, um, you know, learn, follow APRP, <laughs> um, follow Public Action Alliance. You know, we're also always connecting and trying to uplift other indigenous organizations. You know, it's, um, it, it takes a lot of time, you know, there's not, there's not one answer, but again, um, immediately I thought of, you know, what indigenous land base do you come from and how can you continuously work to maintain that connection there? Thank you so much, Reyes. Do either of the other panelists have thoughts on this question? Yeah, I just, I agree wholeheartedly. I just, I just would add, um, or not add, but just um, contribute that. Um, I think it's important, like when we, the, the best way we think for folks to learn about our, the, our histories and our relationship is we we believe is we is by encouraging people to belong to organizations that have mass organized political education processes so that the learning becomes institutionalized because our enemies they institutionalize miseducation so if we want to combat that we have to institutionalize mass revolutionary political education so we can understand concepts like this is not a new concept like the Qualimbo communities, um, Comrade Reyes in Brazil, that happened hundreds of years ago where African and indigenous people, the first models of community defense in the Western hemisphere. So if we understand that this is our history, then we will eliminate this, this thing that, oh, it can't happen. We can't get these all these folks together. We've already done it. We just have to figure out how to do it in this day and time, which is just a question of strategy and, and tactics. So this mass political education is important so that we can begin to erase the negative propaganda. Oh, you know, you, you people aren't, you can't come together. You can't unify. You can't unify with yourselves. You can't unify with other communities. We can eliminate that kind of negative propaganda, which has no basis in history. Right. And what you and Reyes just left it up is the importance of knowing ourselves, of understanding our own histories and our own cultures and our own contexts, our own struggles. Like we learn so much misinformation about our own existence within capitalism, within settler colonialism. And so absolutely a part of the process of building revolution has to be that work of political education. And also as Jammu uplifted, revolutionary organization. There has never been a revolution in the history of the world that has not been organized 
In case after case after case, we have seen superior revolutionary organization defeat empires. Like African and indigenous and Chicano people's history is a history of drastically outmatched people using superior organization to defeat much stronger enemies. So we deeply appreciate both of those answers. And actually one, um, so today is actually the fourth anniversary of the passing of Fidel Castro, um, one of the great revolutionary leaders in history who was very drastically misunderstood um, in the US. Like we hear nothing but lies about Fidel Castro in the United States. And so I want to open up the space for y'all. This is a question for me, I guess. I want to open up the space for y'all about any thoughts that you had about Fidel Castro, anything you want to share about him today. I can remember when I went to Cuba on the Vencedemus Brigade a number of years back with one of our compañeras here in Albuquerque, uh, Victoria. Uh, we, there was a panel that uh, Fidel spoke at and the Vencedemus Brigade had been invited there. So afterwards, you know, we're mingling with him. We got to shake his hand and we gave him a copy of our book, 500 Years of Chicano History. And he said that he'd, he, 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 he nodded his head like he'd seen it before. I don't want to say he had a copy or anything like that, but he, he said he was very appreciative of, of that gift. Yeah, one thing, uh, this is like a, this wasn't my personal experience, but a, a friend of mine who's a film, a filmmaker in California uh, did a movie about 15 years ago, a documentary that's really worth watching about Corda, the photographer that accompanied uh, Fidel Castro and the, uh, you know, the folks from the July 26 movement moving into governance in Cuba and then uh, moving the process forward. Uh, there, it's called Corda Vision. Really, highly recommended. But he was telling me, if you watch that movie, uh, Fidel Castro is getting interviewed by him or by somebody else, like, and he's filming it. And Fidel makes references to people in the room, and he talks about this person over there who's Cuban and this other person, and then he says, "And the Chicano." You know, he didn't say the guy from the United States. He didn't say the Mexican-American or, or Mexicano. He said the Chicano, you know, and he left that purposefully in the movie because he understood that that was significant in terms of um, just the fact that the Cubans did have uh, the sense that they had uh, of what was going on inside uh, what is known as the United States and, and, uh, which was something that became obvious to you if uh, you went on a brigade, especially back in the in the seventies and eighties, no, um, because there was it, the Cubans were very conscious about wiring us not only to things of importance in Cuba per se, but also to international delegations. They saw it as important. They put us on the same plane almost uh, uh, in terms of folks that came from from here and and, and went there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think about Fidel a lot. Um, and yeah. I was just thinking about that today. So I figured I'd share that. Yeah, like Luis, I, I think about Fidel an awful lot. And the thing that, um, you know, that just, I use him a lot for my own personal inspiration. And I have for my whole adult life. And, and one of the main things I'm always thinking about is how, uh, the Cuban Revolution was able to outsmart U.S. imperialism time and time again. If you start from 1955, when they actually had Fidel, Raul, Juan Almeida, Che Guevara locked up in jail, and they were able to get out of that. Imagine if they would have never been able to get out of jail. They were able to get out of that to the military defeat that they won in Cuba in January 1959 to the defeat of U.S. imperialist soldiers in Playa del Garon, or what they call the Bay of Pigs in 61, the missiles in October in 62, um, all the way up through um, the Ileon Gonzalez, the Mario boat lift in 1980. Every step of the way, Cuba, with Fidel's leadership, was able to outsmart U.S. imperialism all the way up to the present day. And so what that does for me is it it always serves as an inspiration and it brings to light what Huey P. Newton, the co-founder of the Black Panther Party said, the man's technology will never defeat the spirit of the people and the Cuban people and the Cuban socialist revolution to me has always been the first example I always think of to illustrate that point. And 
to demonstrate that they're just getting started. You know, the, the victories that they're going to achieve are just getting started. And the way that we, the rest of the world, can emulate that is really an inspiration for how we're going to build the type of world that we all want and deserve. Thanks. Thank you all so much for your comments on Fidel. Like I said, um, that is a man who is drastically misrepresented um, in the US. And so it's really important that we lift up the truth about who he was. I always like to say that we are so much better off in terms of the struggle for justice because the Cuban revolution happened and because Fidel Castro existed. So much gratitude for the existence of Fidel. Oh, Ray, is he got something to add? Yeah, um, I just wanted to um, quickly share, um, you know, if anybody is wanting to take action and be in solidarity with the Guarani Kiowa peoples of Brazil, um, you can actually head over to our website. And in our website, I uh, wrote a little bit about my experience there. But if you go all the way to the bottom, you also find all the links where you can follow and support the work that is also matriarch <laughs> led. Um, and you can um, also find links to ways that you can donate to them because again, they are um, disproportionately and severely impacted with COVID right now. And um, any donations are, are appreciated towards them right now. And um, yeah. I'm going to drop that um, link into the chat also. Thank you so much. And I will also put this on the social media chats. Cool. So one final question, actually, if there's anyone on Zoom or again, watching on social media that has any questions for our panelists, we have about 10 minutes left in the program before we start moving to the close. So please drop those into the chat or on the comments on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter and we will make sure to ask them. But the last question I have for y'all is how can folks show up in solidarity with Cuba today? I'm gonna call on y'all. Ajamu, you're not okay. muted. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one way, like I said before, is go visit Cuba, go to Cuba, go with the Vincent Emmis Brigade. Uh, uh, there's uh, Pastors for Peace, there's other organizations, go to Cuba. Go to Cuba and see for yourself. See uh, uh, for your own eyes all the lies that we've been told by our, by our own US government. Go to Cuba, visit there, come back, share your experiences with people. That's always been one good, like I said, the Vents that must Brigade has sent over 10,000 people to Cuba since 1969. And so it's, it's important for us to go there and show them that solidarity because for a long time it was illegal to go to Cuba. We went knowing that we could be arrested, but for us, it was important to go. And uh, we encourage our audience to go to Cuba, contact us. We'll hook you up as best as we can. I absolutely agree. People definitely need to go to Cuba. I'm gonna challenge people though, that go there as a part of an organized effort. It's great to go individually, but go there as a part of an organized effort where you're a part of an organization. And then either before you go, while you're there or when you come back, ensure that you have that political education process in place so that you can continue to study the Cuban revolution. You can read in defense of socialism by Fidel Castro. You can read You can read. We Are Cuba by Helen Jaffe. There's a lot of information out here, and this is an information-based society. So there is no reason other than intellectual laziness for so many people to be so confused about the truth. So the only way we can ever correct that is we have to get people engaged in consistent processes that are designed to break down this backwardness that does nothing except further advance the interests of those who want to continue to plunder all of humanity. Yeah, I took, uh, I took a lot of people down to Cuba, especially in the aughts, uh, from the late 90s into the aughts. And um, that work became limit, more limited at that point in time when you know, the Bush Jr. administration just shut down things like crazy between the US and Cuba. It was worse than it was under Reagan, frankly, uh, in terms of what 
they were allowing or not allowing to happen. And, you know, when we did have that space, some of us would work to take advantage of it, you know. Um, and uh, the, the whole thing of institutional ties, functional institutional ties that get people working together, uh, people in the United States and their Cuban counterparts, that is important. Uh, I agree very much with what Ojamu, Ojamu was just saying. Um, and I think it's important for organizations to go to Cuba, for people to go in an organized way. But I, I also think it's important for those organizations to establish uh, fraternal ties with mm -hmm. counterpart institutions in Cuba, right? I think another thing that's important is for getting our young folks down there studying things. Uh, the medical school has been mentioned. Uh, it's very powerful. I mean, people can go down there and they might, you know, I mean, Cuba ain't necessarily for everybody, you know, and, and there's, you know, it's not like everybody in Cuba is on the same exact train moving along. There's a lot of differences of opinion in Cuban society about which end is up there. And, and frankly, uh, that's a very healthy thing for that country. I think that's a conclusion I've come to over many years, but um, uh, I, I've seen people go to the medical school from, from here and they come back and maybe they're not in it so much about Cuba and the revolution. Most of them, that's the case, but just the fact that they're practicing medicine here, you know, and they've been trained in community medicine. They've been trained in preventive medicine, all these things that we need so badly uh, in our communities and the kind of perspective that they bring with them on health, them back with on healthcare is critical, but there's other things people can do. I mean, there's um, uh, different kinds of study programs people can go uh, into. And if they do that, uh, they're going to be relating to Cubans, but chances are they're also gonna be relating to all kinds of people from uh, the, the historically colonized world, the global South, whatever you call it. Um, and those are important relationships. Um, but getting, getting back here, the most important thing is for more people to know more stuff about Cuba, you know, uh, for it to be at some level part of their discourse uh, and for people to, uh, to, to, to raise a level of understanding here in terms of what the relationship has been between uh, this country and Cuba historically, right? Because that's been, uh, it's been an amazing process. Uh, and there's been a lot of good things that have come out. There's especially amongst African, African descended people historically. I mean, there's been these strong relationships that go back to the time when, uh, when uh, African people in the United States were able to go to Cuba and vacation in ways that they couldn't do in other places, you know? Uh, it, it, there's been books that, that have been written about that or, or relationships just along uh, in terms of sports, right? Uh, Lisa Brock, a comrade up in, in Chicago, Illinois, wrote a whole book on that. Uh, that's really, really interesting. Uh, to, you learn a lot from it. So in other words, there were ties that were developed with Cuba. And a lot of the times, uh, these, there were definitely a political component uh, to those ties. Um, so... That is something that's really important. The, the, uh, the Cubans uh, have a lot of love for people here. And I think it's important for people to understand that. And I, I think just looking back at what US policy has been at different moments, uh, you have this thing they call people to people where you send people down to, you know, they figure if we send people down to Cuba, they're gonna teach the Cubans all about democracy. And, you know, the Cuban revolution will surely die. Uh, because there's going to be so much weight in, you know, the moral weight that people from the United States are going to take there. Um, and uh, what I found out, because I was taking a lot of people down there, is that that's not how it worked. <laughs> you know, they'd come back in here and they'd be like, you know, what the hell? You know, why are we treating this country this way? Or why is this government treating uh, Cuba the way it is? And uh, that... I always seen that happen, you know, even amongst, uh, I mean, if, if somebody went down there and they had, you know, you carry a lot of luggage when you go to Cuba because, you know, you, if you don't know about it, then you're going to make certain assumptions. If you do know about it, then you're making assumptions or you think you know about it. And, 
and so, you know, some people go to, I've seen people even on the left go to Cuba and they come back and they're basically confirming what they brought, took with them there. You know, as a matter of fact, sometimes I've found in doing that kind of work, people on the left being some of the most difficult to deal with, you know, because they'll go down to Cuba and they won't understand what certain dynamics are about because it's based on their assumptions that they, the luggage that they care with them, right? Carry with them um, to Cuba. But uh, for the most part, people get pretty blown away by the experience. They pick up new things. And, and in my case, uh, you personally, I, I was pretty set in my ways the first time I went to Cuba when I was like just 20 years old. Um, I think Cuba helped sharpen things. But one thing that did happen was that there are things that uh, I was exposed to or, or interactions I had from those very first times I went to Cuba that I still think about today. You know, I still reflect back on that. And, um, and it's, it's uh, Cuba's our natural ally in the struggle. And that concept, that understanding has to be cultivated, I think. I I, um, I also wanted to add to um, is that a direct and indirect way to support Cuba solidarity is to follow the Mexico VB. <laughs> I, I think that what you guys are doing is amazing and it is unique because the way that you guys are all sharing and educating the working class peoples is coming from a wide perspective a wide perspective of Chicano people, of indigenous peoples, of African peoples. Therefore, you are gaining an immense amount of knowledge and lived experiences that come from each of these backgrounds, but then also each of the experiences that um, have had, um, that have happened because of each of these people that have been able to travel to Cuba. You know, I personally have not traveled to Cuba, but I cannot wait for that day to come. Um, I'm going to be right there with the Mexico VB <laughs> the next time that it happens. Um, but again, you know, share the work that the Mexico VB is doing. The theme that I also noticed throughout this panel was that, you know, propaganda is a huge issue here, right? So like educate to liberate, you know, and it's a lot of work. It is, you know, it's a lot of labor to talk about, you know, it gets emotional, you know, but we do it out of the love for our people. We want to um, liberate ourselves and our people. So it has to come with that education, you know, and it has to, you know, PAA speaks this all the time. It has to be accessible and it needs to be intergenerational. If we want to move our people in any kind of revolutionary work, it has to happen that way. And that's by following the Mexico VB, you know, in the MST, another example is that the campus that they have right outside of Sao Paulo, they go through an entire political education course before they're really allowed to kind of serve any other kind of role within the MST. And so with like, the reason I mentioned that is that remember that revolution takes time. It takes a lot of work and it is not pretty all the time, you know, and we need to mentally prepare ourselves for that, you know, and whenever your spirit is feeling down, you know, remember where your roots are, remember where you come from, you know, maintain that grounding and that connection, um, because that's super important, you know, and that's obviously why, you know, we're doing this work is because we have that connection to our people and to our land bases. Thank you all so much for being on the panel, for sharing your knowledge. This was incredibly rich and powerful, this conversation. We had quite a few people joining us. It's been so gratifying to hear you speak. Um, once again, my name is Onya Sanu. I'm a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party and also the New Mexico Organizing Committee of the Vencinemos Brigade. Um, we want to thank you so much for joining us. I want to pass it to my comrade Sheldon to share some information about how you can support the Vincennes Brigade and also to close us out. Cool, awesome, Oni, thank you. And thank you to everybody on the panel. Uh, so much, so much appreciation, so much gratitude from y'all. 
Um, thank you to the New Mexico BB. Thank you to everybody tuning in. Thank you to everybody here on Zoom as well. So good to see a lot of people both here on Zoom and on the live feeds as well. Again, my name is Sheldon Tenorio. I'm from Kiwa Pueblo. I organize with Pueblo Action Alliance as well. And here, part of the Venceremos uh, Brigade Committee as well in Tiwa territory. Um, just wanna offer some next steps. Again, uh, folks who wanna stay involved, follow us on Facebook. Uh, folks who have uh, just questions or ideas as well, check out the bbforcuba.com.org uh, as well. You can also find a donation link there as well. Um, if you would like to donate and either uh, go to Cuba when we can, or also um, help get others there as well. So again, just want to say thank you uh, to everybody. Uh, again, thank you to the panel and thank you to everybody tuning in and those who registered. And then join us again uh, every last uh, Wednesday of every month. So we have programming. And again, follow the Mexico VB.